This is the motto of the show Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, but gold still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase With iron heel and iron hand The Roman Pope's rule the land Those ignorant of history May be swept into apostasy We won't be loved by Rome's sweet lie with 50 million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone In Christ alone, by grace alone A sovereign God give faith to man Salvation's in the Maker's hand This gospel offends Rome today They offer up Another way, a counterfeit, a compromise Beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today Hello and welcome to a new video from Jogla 66, Hour of the Truth. This is reading number 33 of the book that I'm currently reading and that you of course know, uh, History of the Inquisition by Philip from Limborg. And we are talking today in the 33rd part, starting on page 62 of the Wars Against Raymond, Father and Son, Earls of Toulouse. That's the subject. But before I start, I want to give you a little introduction. Um, I was planning on reading another book of the Inquisition in English because I started reading in German a three-parter, three volumes of a book from Henry Charles Lear that you can also get, of course, in English. Uh, History of the Inquisition in the Middle Ages, Henry Charles Lear from the end of the 19th century. But I started reading that in German and all three volumes is about 2,000 pages. So when I took that work on me, I thought, well, there's another interesting book in English that I want to read after finishing this one from Philip von Limborg that is called The History of the Evangelical Churches of the Valleys of Piemont. And um, that, of course, you can get in a PDF. I'm just seeing if I can get that here. The History of the evangelical I should find it like this here you see this is the book this is a PDF I'm gonna show it to you like I have it here on my computer and um, this seemed to me a wonderful book to read it is from uh, the author Samuel Morland uh, it is also from uh, I think the 17th century um, it deals especially uh, with the evangelical churches of the Valley of Piemont. So this means the Valdenses and the Albigenses, probably, most of the part. 
And why am I telling you this? Well, because I ordered this uh, two-volume book that I show you here as a PDF that has 796 pages, the PDF. I ordered this from ABE Books. ABE. And I just want to tell you that uh, I paid 50 euros, about 50 euros. The price was in uh, British pounds and inclusive including transportation costs it came to about 50 euros for the two volumes but the problem is that the book that I received when we go a little bit into what how the reading is here uh, you see that this reading is um, well okay you can read it but it's not very nice it's not very uh, <laughs> It's not very easy to read, even though this is uh, quite nice of a quality. I don't know if the whole book is like this. My point being is, oh, so when we go into here, you see it's getting smaller and it's not so easy to read here. I thought, well, that would be nice to have as a book to hold in my hands and to read to you. And when I ordered this, this, what we see here, they just put in print in the same quality even sometimes that it is unreadable yeah i paid 50 bucks for that and it was a scam yeah? i was absolutely betrayed because i paid 50 bucks for a printed pdf i don't call that selling a book i'm just telling you that because i want you to be warned for in case that you are going to order this book the history of the evangelical churches of the valley of piemont from samuel morland if you are planning buying these books that you make sure that you don't get a just printed pdf like i got and that's quite a shame because i was really looking forward to read that book too but yeah anyway so i'm gonna keep it for the moment with the book the history of the inquisition by philip from limborch and we are going to continue on page uh, 62, I think it was, as I said, yeah, page 62, of the wars against Raymond, father and son, earls of Toulouse. Now, we are going to start, but I wanted to let you know that little introduction here. In the meanwhile, the Pope, the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, being intent on the extirpation of heretics, excited all the princes that they should not yield them any refuge in their dominions, but oppress them with all their force. He orders, in other words, the temporal power to obey the spiritual. His principal care of the Pope was to expel them, that was the quote-unquote heretics, the Albigenses and the Valdenses, Bible-believing Christians, from the country of Toulouse, where the Albigenses were numerous, or were very numerous even. He was perpetually pressing Raymond, Earl of Toulouse, to banish them from his dominions, and when he could not prevail with them either to drive out so large a number of men or to persecute them, he ordered them him to be excommunicated as a favourer of heretics. He also sent his legate with letters to many of the prelates, commanding them to make inquisition against the uh, against the heretical Albigenses in France, and to destroy them and convert their favorers. He also wrote to Philip, King of France, that he should take arms against those heretics and use his utmost force to suppress them that by endeavouring to prevent the progress of their heresy he might be under no suspicion of being tainted with it himself. With the Pope's legate here came also twelve abbots of the Cistercian order, preaching the cross against the Albigenses and promising by the authority of Antichrist Pope Innocent a plenary remission of all sins to all who took on them the crusade. To these Dominic joined himself, and, as we have related about the founding of the Dominican order, here it comes, as to these Dominic joined himself, and as we have related, he invented in that expedition the Inquisition. So this is actually how the Inquisition was formed, 
by Dominic, the founder of the Dominicans, when he joined what the Pope's legate was telling about the abbots of the Cistercian order, when he got to know of that, he founded the Inquisition. The Roman pontiffs had appointed this kind of war, which they called holy, a holy war, a crusade, against the infidels and Saracens for the recovery of the Holy Land. You know, those are the Muslims who were disobedient, who did not fulfill their part of the contract between the Roman Catholic Church and the Islam that the Roman Catholic Church founded some centuries ago. And because all who listed themselves in that service wore the sign of the cross near their shoulders, they were called cross-bearers. They ordered it also to be proclaimed that all who would enter into that holy war, all who would enter into that crusade, or piously contribute any money for the pay of the soldiers, being confessed and penitent according to the rules and methods fixed by the divines, should obtain a full indulgence and remission of their sins, and be absolved from the sentences of interdict, suspension and excommunication, and especially from those they had incurred by firing or breaking into churches, or by laying violent hands on ecclesiastics, and from all other sentences, except the crime was so enormous, that they could not receive absolution, but immediately from the apostolic see. What does that mean? that everybody who volunteered to join the crusade, the holy war against the infidels and the Saracens, got a, as it is called here, uh, a full indulgence and remission of their sins. Yeah. So whatever you have done, you are forgiven by the Pope, who cannot forgive any sin, but they believe this, you are forgiven all your sins and you get a complete remission of sins when you join these crusades. They were allowed also, in the time of a general interdict, to be present at divine services and to receive the ecclesiastical sacraments in those places where they were celebrated by a special indulgence from the apostolic see if they had been absolved before from their respective sentences, as may be seen in the Bull of Innocent the Fourth, which begins Malicia Huius Temporis, that by the hopes of this immunity men might be excited to undertake these expeditions. Accordingly, multitudes came together and cheerfully engaged in them, upon the, uh, upon the belief that they could, in too easy and so easy a manner, atone for their sins. You know, get rid of your sins. Well, just go to the military. Just go out and kill other people, and you are relieved of all your sins. You have atonement for all your sins. But now the popes turned these expeditions against Christians themselves. And we are speaking here with the word Christians about real Christians, about Albigenses and Waldenses, whom they had loaded with the infamous name of heretics, only because they were enemies to their sea and the exorbitant power of it. Some of these cross-bearers Dominic sent into the country of Toulouse against the Albigenses, to overcome those heretics by the material sword, whom he could not cut off by the sword of the word of God. In other words, when you cannot be convinced by the quote-unquote word of God, the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, then you will feel the material sword. Or, in other words, as you, has, as you have heard me say before, convert or die. Now, between uh, uh, brackets here, it uh, continues in the book. For this fraternity, Dominic framed certain constitutions by which they were to preserve and govern themselves. Now, this already reminds me, before I even read on, we should recall 
the constitutions of the Jesuits because here we are speaking about the Dominican order and the Dominican order took over the Inquisition in 1542 from uh, the Jesuits took order from the Dominican order the Inquisition in 1542 as we read in Rulers of Evil now this fraternity from Dominic the Dominicans framed certain constitutions now let's see in how in, in which way the constitution of the Dominican order resemble the constitutions of the Jesuits. This is going to be an interesting study, I think. The first was, the first constitution, that is, that such who entered into this warfare should take a solemn oath that they would endeavor with all their might to recover, defend and protect the rights of the Church, means the Pope, the Antichrist, the Roman Catholic Church, against all who should pretend to usurp them. And that in defense of the ecclesiastical effects, they would expose themselves and their own estates and take up arms as often as they should be called on to do it, by the prelate of, war, of the war, who was then Dominic, and afterwards the the masters general of the dominican order yeah? dominic further exacted an oath from the let's see i have to get on the new page here from the wives of these cross bearers if any of them were married that they would not persuade their husbands to forsake this war for the support of the ecclesiastical immunity and promised them eternal life for so holy a service. And to distinguish them from other laics, he ordered that both the men and their wives should wear garments of white and black color, though they differed as to their make. They also repeated in the canonical hours the Lord's Prayer and the salutation of the angel so many times as was customary in any other common ward. It was ordained also that none should be admitted to this sacred warfare without a previous rigorous examination of his life, manners and faith, whether he had paid his debts, forgiven his enemies, made his will, that he might be more ready for the battle, and obtained leave from his wife before a notary and proper witnesses. The wives of those who were slain in the expedition promised they would never marry again. This kind of warfare was at that time very acceptable, so that many eagerly uh, entered into it, that by the slaughter of heretics and the plunder of their goods, they might march away to heaven. Now, this very last sentence, where the brackets also end, I'm going to highlight and read again, and I want to ask you diligently to compare that what is written here to what is written in the Bible. What does it say? This kind of warfare was at that time very acceptable, so that many eagerly entered into it, that by the slaughter of heretics and the plunder of the heretics' goods, they might march away to heaven. And in what world are we living today in 2017? Aren't we living in the world where there are these armies, private armies, like um, Blackwater, as it was called in that time? People are promised a lot of money to go there, slaughter heretics and plunder their goods, and that they therefore will be rewarded with a wonderful life here on earth, wonderful money, and probably also get a march right way into heaven. Think about it. But the author continues, but because even these cross bearers did not fight against them with that continued zeal and fury that the Pope and Dominic would have had them, the Dominicans excited larger numbers to engage in this warfare by the hopes of a plenary indulgence. The text 
which their preachers used to choose for this purpose was from Psalm, 16, uh, Psalm 94, verse 16. Quote, who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Unquote. <laughs> Can you see how the Pope is misusing Bible verses for his purposes? In the Bible they said, who will rise up for me against the evildoers, who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity, and this is not speaking about, I mean, when you read the Bible, this is speaking about the heathen, yeah? and uh, the fall in the way, and here the Roman Catholic Church uses this for its purposes to give a legal look at the Inquisition. Yeah? Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? The Pope says in this case, because the Pope interprets that, that the Bible, uh, that he speaks of it. Or who will stand up for me, for the Pope, against the workers of iniquity? Because the people who are Bible-believing Christians are workers of iniquity in the eyes of the Pope, in the eyes of the Antichrist. And as they directed their whole sermons to their own cruel purpose, they generally thus, thus concluded, quote, You see, most dear brethren, how great the wickedness of the heretics is, and how much mischief they do in the world. You see also how tenderly and by how many pious methods the church labors to reclaim them. But with them they all but with them they all prove ineffectual, and they fly to the secular power for their defense. Therefore, our Holy Mother Church, though with reluctance and grief, calls together against them the Christian army. If then you have any zeal for the faith, if you are touched with any concern for the honor of God, if you would reap the benefit of this great indulgence and come receive the sign of the cross, which reminds me of the saying in hoc signo winces in this sign conquer, huh? come and receive the sign of the cross and join yourselves to the army of the crucified Savior. So, in other words, in this quote we read that the army of the crucified Savior, who is Jesus Christ, are people who have zeal and faith and take up a physical sword to kill so-called heretics. There was indeed this difference between those who took up the cross against the Saracens and those who did it against the heretics, that the former wore it on their backs and the latter on their breasts, and that their zeal might by, uh, that their zeal might by no means grow cool. There were certain synodical decrees made by the authority of the Antichrist, by which the presbyters were enjoyed uh, enjoined continually to excite and warm it. Let the presbyters continually and effectually exhort their parishioners that they arm themselves against the heretical Albigenses. Let them also enjoin under the pain of ex excommunication those who have taken the cross and not prosecuted their vow that they retake the cross and wear it. Raymond, Earl of Toulouse, not being in the least diverted from this purpose by the sentence of the legate, who, having consulted with Dominic, had forbid him, as a favourer of heretics, the communion of holy things and of the faithful, was excommunicated by a bull of innocent himself, as a defender of heretics, and all his subjects absolved from their oath of allegiance, and power was given to any Catholic man, though without prejudice to the right of the supreme of the supreme Lord, not only to act against his person, but to seize and detain his country, 
under this pretense, under this pretense chiefly, that it might be effectually purged from heresy by the prudence of the, uh, of the one as it had been grievously wounded and defiled by the wickedness of the other. The earl, frightened by this sentence, and especially by the terrible expedition of the cross-bearers against him, promised obedience and fought to be reconciled to the church but could not obtain it without delivering up to the legate seven castles in his territories for security and performance, and unless the magistrates of Avignon, Nîmes and Age had interceded for him, and bound themselves by an oath that if the earl should disobey the commands of the legate, they would renounce their allegiance to him. It was farther added, that the county of Venetian should return to the obedience of the Church of Rome. The manner of the reconciliation of the Earl of Toulouse was, according to Bzovius, thus, quote, The Earl was brought before the gates of the Church of St. Age in the town of that name. There were present more than twenty archbishops and bishops who were met with his, uh, who were met for this purpose. The Earl swore upon the holy body of our Lord Jesus Christ and the relics of the saints, which were exposed with great reverence before the gates of the church and held by several prelates, that he would obey the commands of the holy Roman church, not adhere to the commands of the Bible and of the God of the Bible, but the commands of the holy Roman church. When he had thus bound himself by an oath, the legate ordered one of the sacred vestments to be thrown over his neck, and drawing him thereby, brought him into the church, and having scorched him with a whip, absolved him. Nor must it be omitted that when the said Earl was brought into the church and received his absolution as he was scourging, he was so grievously torn by the stripes that he could not go out by the same place through he which he entered, but was forced to pass quite naked as he was through the lower gate of the church. He was also served in the same manner at the sepulchre of St. Peter the Martyr at New, uh, New Chastris, whom the earl had caused to be slain." Unquote. However, the vast army of the cross-bearers was not idle after the reconciliation of the Earl of Toulouse, but everywhere attacked the heretics, took their cities, filled all places with slaughter and blood, and burned many of them who, had, who they had taken captives. For in the year 1209, Bitter was taken by them, and all, without any regard of age, cruelly put to the sword, and the city itself destroyed by the flames. Caesarius tells us that when the city was taken, the cross-bearers knew there were several Catholics mixed with the heretics. But when they were in doubt how to act, left the Catholics should be slain or the heretics signed themselves Catholics, Arnold Abbot of Sisto made answer, quote, Slay them all, for the Lord knows who are this. Unquote whereupon the soldiers slew them, all without exception. <sighs> Heavy stuff, eh? And this is not even about the Inquisition yet. What does Jesus say? Jesus said, The wheat grows among the tares, and in the time of the right season, at the time of the harvest, at the time of his return, the wheat shall be gathered in barns, and the tares shall be burned. What does the Roman Catholic Church say when there are here, quote unquote, several her Catholics mixed with the heretics? What do they say? When they were in doubt how to act, left the Catholics should be slain, or the heretics signed themselves Catholics, 
Arnold, Abbot of Sisto, made the answer, Slay them all, for the Lord knows who are his. So, this is against, of course, anyway, because it's going about killing, but you know, this is absolutely going against the teaching of the Lord. Slay them all, the abbot says, for the Lord, no, the Lord knows who are his. Whereupon the soldier slew them all, without any exception. Carcassonne also was destroyed, that's a town in the south of France, and by the common consent of the prelates and barons, Simon, Earl of Montfort, of the bastard race of Robert, King of France, whom Petavius in his uh, Rational Temporis calls a man as truly religious as a valiant, was made governor of the whole country, both of what was already conquered and what was to be conquered in the future. The same year he took several cities and reduced them to his own obedience. He cruelly treated his captive heretics and put them to death by the most horrible punishments. In the city Castres, two were condemned to the flames, and when a certain person declared he would abjure his heresy, the cross-bearers were divided amongst themselves. Some contended that he ought not to be put to death, others said it was plain he had been an heretic, and that his abjuration was not sincere, but proceeded only from his fear of immediate death. Earl Montfort consented that he should be burnt, alleging that if his conversion was real, the fire would expiate but his sins, if otherwise, that he would receive a just reward of his per, uh, persidiousness. In other places also they agreed with like cruelty. One Robert, who had been of the sect of the Albigenses and afterwards joined himself to the Dominicans, supported by the authority of the princes and magistrates, burned all who persisted in their heresy, so that within two or three months he caused fifty persons, without distinction of sex, either to be buried alive or burned from whence he gained the name of the Hammer of the Heretics. Reynold affirms that it ought not to be doubted, but that Pope Innocent appointed him to this office. At Paris, one Bernard, with nine others, of whom four were priests, the followers of Almeric, were apprehended, and being, <coughs> and being all had into a field, were degraded before the whole clergy and people and burned in the presence of the king. The year following there was undertaken a new expedition of the crossbearers against the Albigenses. They seized on Albi, that's where the name of Albigenses comes from, that town, Albi in the south of France. They seized on Albi and there put many to death. They took Lavour by force and burnt in it great numbers of the Albigenses. They hanged Aymeric, the governor of the city, who was of a very noble family. They beheaded eighty of lesser degree, and did not spare the very woman. They threw Girarda, Emmerich's sister, and the chief lady of that people into an open pit, and covered her with stones. Afterwards they conquered Carcum and put to death sixty men. They also seized on Pulcra Vallis, a large city near Toulouse, and burned in it four hundred Albigenses and hanged even fifty more. They took Chastre de Termi, and in it Raymond de Termi, whom they put in prison, where, they, uh, where he died and burned in one large fire his wife, his sister, his virgin daughter, with some noble ladies, where they could not persuade them, by promises of threats, to embrace the faith of the Church of Rome. Another example, like all throughout the book, of convert or die.
Now the Earl of Toulouse, terrified with the successes of Simon Montfort and fearing for himself and country, raised a great army and had forces sent him from the King of England and Aragon to whom he was related. For he married Joan, sister of the King of England who had been formerly Queen of Sicily and had by her, uh, by her son named Raymond. After her death he married Eleanor, the sister of the King uh, of Peter, King of Aragon. But this army was defeated with a great slaughter of the crossbearers under the command of Earl Montfort, and the Earl of Toulouse driven from his dominions. About the beginning of the year 1215, in a council of certain archbishops and bishops near Montpellier, held by the Pope's legate, Montfort was declared lord of all the countries he had conquered, and the archbishop of Ambrun was sent well, let's see where we go further here, was sent to the Pope to get him to ratify the council sentence, and Louis, eldest son of Philip, the French king, confirmed him in the possession. During these transactions, Pope Innocent III, how can a Antichrist, the man of sin, even choose the name Innocent? That in itself is, if it weren't so, said a real joker. Eh? During these transactions, Pope Innocent III, Antichrist Pope Innocent III, in the year of our Lord 1215, called the famous Lateran Council, where Dominic was present, in which there were many decrees against heretics, which were afterwards infer uh, inserted in the decretals of Gregory. Uh, Titulus de Heraet Capitum 13. To this council fled the Earl of Toulouse with his son Raymond, being dispossessed of his dominions by Montfort. Guido, the brother of Earl Montfort, appeared against him, and after many debates, Earl Raymond is declared to be forever excluded from his dominions, which he had governed ill and ordered to remain in some convenient place out of his own lands in order to his giving suitable proofs of his repentance. 400 marks of silver, uh, you know marks, the currency, the former currency of Germany, 400 marks of silver were assigned him yearly out of his revenues, as long as he behaved himself with an humble obedience. But as all bore testimony to his wife, so she was a good Catholic lady, she was left in possession of the lands of, dow of her dowry, provided she caused the commands of the churches to be uh, the commands of the church to be observed and suffered none to disturb the affairs of peace for faith. However, all that the crossbearers had taken was adjudged at to Montfort, and as to the rest, which they had not seized on, the church decreed it should be kept by proper persons to preserve the peace and the faith, that there might be some provision for the only son of the Earl of Toulouse according as he should deserve it in part or whole after his coming of age. Upon this decree the synod Raymond went into Spain, and his son Raymond into Provence, where, with the help of many auxiliary forces, he made war on Montfort. He recovered some part of his dominions and even the city of Toulouse itself. Whilst Montfort was endeavouring to retake it with a large army, he was killed by the blow of a stone, and thereby the city delivered from the siege. Thus Raymond recovered by arms his father's earldom, who died in the year 1221, and was succeeded by, by this his son, who could not obtain, with all his endeavours, a Christian burial for his father. A Catholic burial, let's say. As things thus took a different turn, sometimes according to the Pope's wish, at other times contrary to it, he pressed the Inquisition as the most effectual remedy for the exportation of heretics. 
Zovius relates that at this, uh, at this time many heretics were burned in Germany, in France and in Italy and that in this year no less than 80 persons were apprehended at once in the city of Strasbourg of, which, uh, of whom but a very few were declared innocent. That is, Strasbourg is the seat of the European Parliament today. If any of these denied their heresy, Friar Conrad of Marburg, an apostolical inquisitor of the Order of the Predicants, put them to the trial of the fire ordeal, and as many of them as were burned by the iron he delivered over to the secular power to be burned as heretics, so that all who were accused and put to this trial, a few excepted, were condemned to the flames. About that time, Pope Honorius, Antichrist Pope Honorius, ha, even <laughs> like innocent Honorius a name. <laughs> I don't understand the Pope can choose, but yeah, you know, they think they are in the right, of course. Anyway, about that time, Antichrist Pope Honorius sent a rescript to the Bishop of Bologna, anathematizing all heretics and violators of the ecclesiastical immunity in these words, quote, We excommunicate all heretics of both sexes, of whatever sect, with their favorers, receivers and defenders, and moreover, all those who cause in any edicts of customs contrary to the liberty of the church to be observed, unless they... Oh, sorry unless they remove them from their public records within two months after the publication of this sentence. Also, we excommunicate the makers and the writers of those statutes, and moreover, all governors, consuls, rulers and councillors of places where such statutes and customs shall be published or kept, and all those who shall presume to pass judgment or to publish such judgments, as shall be made according to them." Unquote. In the meanwhile, after Raymond had recovered his father's dominions, the Inquisition was banished from the country of Toulouse. But Pope Antichrist Honorius III left no stone unturned to render the Earl obnoxious. He took care to let him know by his legate that he should be stripped of his dominions as his father was, unless he returned to his duty and by letters bearing date the 8th of the calendar, uh, the calendar of November, he confirmed the sentence of the legate by which he, de uh, he deprived him of all his right in every country that had ever been subjected to his father. And to give this sentence its full force, he commanded the Dominicans and gave them full power to proclaim a holy war, a crusade to be called the penance war against the heretics. A vast number met together at the sound of this horrid trumpet and entered into this holy society as they believed it, wearing over a white garment a black cloak and receiving the sacrament for the defense of the Catholic faith. And that the Pope and that the Pope might more effectually subdue the Earl of Toulouse, he sent his letters to King Louis, who had succeeded his father Philip, in which he exhorts him to take arms against the Albigenses in this manner. Tis the command of God, if thou shalt hear say in one of thy cities, which the Lord thy God has given thee to dwell there, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, which ye have not known. Thou shalt smite the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, and shalt burn with fire the city. Although you are under many obligations already to God for the great benefits received from him, from whom comes every good gift and every perfect gift, yet you ought to reckon yourself more especially obliged courageously to exert yourself for, the, uh, for him against the subverters of the faith, by whom he is blasphemed and menful 
manfully to defend the Catholic purity, which many in those uh, Paris, ah, okay, uh, which many in those Paris adhering to the doctrine of devils are known to have thrown out. During this, there met a synod at Paris by the Pope's command about the affair of the Albigenses, at which the Pope's legate was present with two archbishops and twenty bishops, where Almeric, son of Simon Montfort, demanded the restitution of the lands of Raymond, Earl of Toulouse, which had been adjudged to him and his father by the Pope and French King. Raymond defended himself before the legate, affirming his country to be free from heresy. He entreated the legate to come to the several cities of his dominions to inquire of all persons the articles of their belief, that if, the, if he found any holding opinion contrary to the Catholic faith, he might punish them according to the rigor of justice. Or, if he should find any city rebelling against him, he would use his utmost power to compel it to make proper satisfaction. For himself he ordered that if he had offended in anything which he doth not remember to have done, he would give full satisfaction to God and Holy Church as became a faithful uh, as become a faithful uh, as became a faithful Christian, and if the legate pleased would submit to an examination of his own faith. But this the legate contempt. Nor could the Catholic Earl, they are the words of the Matthew Paris, find any favour unless he would abjure his patrimony and renounce it for himself and his heirs. So that an expedition of the cross bearers was again resolved on against Earl Raymond, in which Louis the French King engaged by the persuasions of Antichrist Pope Honorius III and many earls and prelates, for fear of the Pope, who had rather been absent, absent as thinking it unworthy to oppress a faithful man and good Christian. And as Raymond held several cautionary lands of the King of England, Antichrist Pope Honorius sent him prohibitory letters to prevent his making war on the French King, or sending assistance to Raymond for the defense of them in these words. Quote, Make no war, either by, our, by yourself or your brother, or any other person on the said king, so long as he is engaged in the affair of faith and service of Jesus Christ. Least by your obstructing the manner, uh, least by your obstructing the matter, which God forbid, the king with his prelates and barons of France should be forced to turn their arms from the extirpation of heretics to their own defence. As for us, since we could not excuse such a conduct and instance of great indevotion, we could not impart to you our paternal favour which otherwise in all proper seasons should never be wanting should never be wanting to you and as there were not only sorry and as we are not only ready to do you justice but even favor as far as god enables us we have taken care that whatever becomes of heretics and their lands your rights and those of the other catholics shall be safe according to the decrees of the foresaid council." Unquote. So that the French king undertook the expedition, and with a large army sat down first before Avignon. But the city was violently defended, and Raymond did, not, uh, did much damage to the besiegers, killing many of them. A great part of the army also, with the king himself, died on the, uh, on the dysentery and other distempters. The Pope's legate concealed the king's death for some time, lest the whole army should be forced to break up with disgrace from the siege of a single city without being able to take it. At length, when the city was not to be conquered by force, the legate had recourse to fraud, uh, had recourse to fraud setting on conferences for peace and giving hostages for security. And when he could not persuade the deputies of the city to yield it up to him, he desired that they would admit him with the prelates who were with him into the city, pretending that he would examine 
into the faith of the inhabitants, and affirming with an oath that he put off the siege of the city for no other cause but to seek the welfare of their souls. He added that the cry of their infidelity had ascended to the Pope. <laughs> like if somebody cries to God, this has ascended to the Pope. <laughs> He added that the cry of their infidelity has had ascended to the Pope, and that he would inquire whether they had done altogether according to the cry which was come up to it, unto him. The citizens, trusting to the legate and suspecting nothing of fraud, agreed under the forementioned condition and the security of an oath on both sides that he, with the prelates and their servants, should enter the city. But the French, as it had been privately agreed, privately agreed, uh, perfidiously followed them, then and violently rushed through the gates as they were opened, and in defiance of their oath, took the citizens, bound them in chains, plundered the city, killed many of the inhabitants, and having thus by treachery obtained the victory broke down the towers and walls of that noble city. Thus Matthew Paris relates this story. Kind of a Trojan horse, eh? Making negotiations on a treaty, on a peace treaty, and then breaking all these vows, and at the moment let the doors open to the besieged city, go in and kill. After Avignon was thus treacherously taken, they bent all their forces against Toulouse. That city sustained the siege for a long while, E. Raymond omitting nothing that became the most, uh, that became the most valiant commander. But at length it was forced to surrender. As for Raymond, after several conferences, he was forced to go to Paris, where he obtained peace upon these conditions, that as Toulouse and the bishopric of Toulouse was given to him only for his life, he should not leave them to any one of his heirs, that none of them or his daughters should after him claim any right, excepting those only who descended from his only daughter Joan and the brother of King Louis, Lord Alphonsius that he should abjure his heresy and promise to be ever after in subjection to the See of Rome, the Holy See, in subjection to the Holy See, that he should expel all heretics, nor by any means defend them, that he should take the cross and his own at his own expense war five years against the Saracens and other enemies of the faith and church, that he should pay 20,000 marks of silver, and yield up to the king of uh, to the king and church all the country beyond the bishopric of Toulouse to the east on this side and the other side the Rhone the Rhone river in uh, the south of France after this he surrendered himself at the Louvre to the king's guards till his daughter and five of his fortified castles were delivered up to his messengers, and the walls of Toulouse entirely demolished. When all this was done, in the presence of two cardinals of the Church of Rome, one legate in France and the other a legate in England, he was led to the high altar in a linen garment, and with naked feet, and absolved from the sentence of excommunication. Bernard, in his cro in his Chronicon of the Roman Pontiffs, relating this history, says, as Bzovius tells us, quote, How holy a sight it was to see so great a man, who for a long while could resist so many and great nations, led naked in his shirt and trousers, with, and with naked feet, to the altar. Unquote. And here is where we're going to stop for the reading of today. 
and next time we will go into chapter 12 as you can see here on the bottom of page 70 several councils held and the laws of the emperor frederick ii by which the office of the inquisition was greatly promoted so we are probably entering a even more bloody time of history with the reading of chapter 12 and of course the forthcoming chapters of this book the history of the inquisition by philip von limborch when i was starting reading this book history of the inquisition in the middle ages by henry charles lear in german in the very beginning of that book um, for about three pages this book from philip von limborch was cited as one of the most um, wonderful works if you can speak with the subject of inquisition of course of wonderful but uh, referable and really uh, great research books ever written philip von limborch henry charles lears was then even placed above that but he used a lot of the knowledge that we are reading in this book to write his book history of the inquisition of the middle ages so when you have a possibility to get that book i advise you to do that and also the history of the evangelical churches of the valleys of piemont volume one and two by samuel morland even though i didn't read it yet but well then at least when you spend money on these books try to get a copy that is worth that money not as i did because i was scammed once again and abe books didn't even reply to my email i sent to them when i well told them that i thought that i was ripped off by what they did anyway up to here the reading today a history of the inquisition by philip von limborch and until next time juggler 66 signing off god bless you and bye bye we must start at the foot of the cross for our souls in danger we're at loss and when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross prison of hell he will send just Christ's work on the cross makes amends God hates those who try to enter in the gates of heaven still full of sin only his son can take sin away go to the foot of the cross this day God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array except what Jesus did for us all he paid our debt, so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior we're total loss.